What's up? What's up? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Broken Brain this week. This is your host, Dwight. This is actually a replay of an episode from a couple years ago. Uh, This is the episode where uh, Sharon Blady, frequent friend of the program and guest, frequent guest, constant friend, I should say, of the program, uh, came on to talk about the Marvel TV show Loki. Uh, We summed up and talked about the, the psychological underpinnings and elements that we see in there and the things that it kind of teaches. I'm really dropping this for a couple of reasons. One is that Sharon and I will be talking about quantum mania soon, which is very tied to the Loki show because of Kang and all that. If you're a, an MCU fan, Stan, or barely plan to see them, then uh, you are familiar, you know, with that probably. Uh, at least somewhat, that these things exist. (laughs) So uh, enjoy this, the replay. Oh, the uh, the second reason is that Loki Season 2 is coming out pretty soon as well. It's been filmed. It's in the can, as they say. So enjoy this uh, this replay of Loki and, you know, look forward to our upcoming new commentary on Quantum Mania. Should be out later this week, as well as uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is coming up. And then, of course, all things that are marvelly will probably show up on this feed eventually thanks so much love y'all recording in progress that's a good marker zoom Zoom tells us to start well this episode's going to be both low-key and high energy so haha anyway (laughs) i've been waiting all morning to use that uh play on words so everybody can enjoy that low-key i get it um, there's, mm-hmm. there is a lot of data to mine here as I was oh. looking at it. And I know we, we had also originally talked about the idea of, uh, Easter eggs fe- features into mm-hmm. what we'll be talking about as well as kind of some of the psychological elements that we can't help but hit that. Oh right? gosh. Yeah. And the other thing I noticed too, for anybody, and this is more a commentary on the media part of it, but um, everything it seems like everything that is coming up in Marvel in this new phase is going to be linked back to some of the events, right? Of Loki, mm-hmm. so that's going to be kind of interesting as well to see how does that play in. So, yeah, they, they planted a lot of really good seeds along the way, and I think that's where some of the Easter eggs and some other things come in, yeah. Absolutely. So, what's your as, as far as when we approach this? Um, I don't know, there's there's various different ways we can start. Um, but one of the ones that I thought I'd get off the bat is some of the chatter that I saw online when this was on, when it was coming out, was some people were very uncomfortable with Loki being a- at all redeemed, particularly because this is the Loki who just barely committed like a genocidal attack on, or, or not genocidal, I should say, mass murdery attack on uh, New York City. Yeah. Um, and so, and I'm not, I'm not really, bo- I wasn't bothered by it. So I was almost a little surprised to see that. Um, but anyway, but, but what do we feel of like a redemption arc? I mean, Tom Hiddleston is so beloved on as in this role that nobody cares what he's done. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that's an interesting thing because he is like, again, you know, in a sense, the favorite villain and, and the idea that, you know, okay, so do they not like the redemption arc because it doesn't make him a villain anymore. And then at the same time I sit there and I go, well, how much was he really a villain and how much was he an anti-hero? And I think that's the other part is, is that sometimes we confuse those two wow. or we, yeah, they, they get conflated, they get mixed up. And, you know, when you stop and think, about it and that's I think one of the things that I loved was right in the very first episode where Mobius says to him because he's giving it the whole you know I don't belong here I'm the god of mischief and and you know Mobius calls him I'm like well what do you do that's really like mischievous like how how mischievous is it really like yes you're doing certain kinds of things but you're, you're kind of like throwing this title around and and all of this arrogance but you're just kind of you know in some cases you just using people or you're this or you're that or how like, you know, compared to other stuff, um, you know, what is it really? And he kind of calls him on his, his reputation. And honestly, like for me, so much of it was the idea of the re- redemption arc. It was in that shorter period. So it wasn't like, you know, Tony Stark's over the course of, you know, how many movies you see the little, the little nods, but um, was this idea that, again, it's the whole hurt people, hurt people. So Loki is the way he is because he's the, you know, 
He's the younger adopted child, da, 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 da. There's all of this stuff that he didn't know. He's, you know, and so he feels so entitled to different things that he feels been taken away from him that he acts out. And then he uses his, well, I'm mischievous. So, you know, I'm the God of mischief is, you know, kind of like his validation for it. And And, I know that I think we've, I think we touched on this uh, another time we were talking, but there is the big element of when there's someone who's a powerful, you know, God, monster, superhero, whatever, um, the idea that, and this has been alive in the comics for a long time, when someone is the anti-hero, when they're more anti than hero, people, maybe they do a lot of really bad stuff because they have the power to. You know, it's not like, oh, I went off on my own bad issues and maybe got a DUI or maybe, you know, caused relationship hurt to someone. It's more like, oh, I kill the planet. Now, I mean, I know in re- if it was real <laughs> life, right? But it's like uh, a more more uh, sweeping mistake. And then they're still around, and what are they going to do? Um, <laughs> that might be dismissive. Well, well, but we're okay with it when it comes to Tony Stark being a weapons manufacturer and, and getting, a, you know, I mean, sort of child soldiering uh, Spider-Man a little bit. And we're okay with him having the redemptive arc when he was pretty horrible. Um, and led to deaths. His choices led to deaths, certainly, when he mm-hmm. was uh, presiding over that. Or Odin in Ragnarok, we learned that here's uh, Loki's adopted father who has a secret past as a terrible conqueror person. Yeah, right? yeah, and, and that, so. that Hela was by his side, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's so... it's like, you know, yeah. <laughs> where, where you suddenly look at the family and you go, like, oh, again, the whole, like, okay, wait a second, Thor's the outcast here. He's the one that doesn't yeah. fit in. Like, he's just the, you know? But, well, no, and, and I think that's the thing, too, is, like, with 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 Loki, I mean, so much of it, and it, that's where, to me, the good storytelling comes in, is that it's, you see that he's, in some respects, the product of his environment, and I, that's where I loved what they did in the what-ifs, to show what could have happened, you know, alternatives. But for me, the redemption arc was always there because, I mean, that's part of the reason why he's lovable because there is still that thing about him that for some reason you still connect to. It's not like, you know, nobody sits there and goes, well, gee, if only Thanos was given a chance. And I was like, <laughs> you know, again, the what if took it and and kind of, you know, threw it in it a different way. It, yeah. But it's still that thing where you're like, okay, yes, they're doing this thing and they're making it funny and, or, or, or they're doing it differently, but people are still sitting there at the cocktail party going, but dude, it's genocide. But dude, it's like, you know, <laughs> like, it's, like it's the, you know, they've, they've, they've given you that other opportunity. And like, the, again, the what if, whereas Loki, there is always that, you know, in some respects, he's the, he's the bratty little brother trying to get attention and is worried that, you know, dad doesn't like him as much and, and all these other kinds of things. So he's just, he's, you know, in perpetual temper tantrum mode. He's, you know, kind of developmentally frozen at a particular age, or it doesn't matter how many millennia old he is. He's still like, and I'm going to have my seven-year-old temper tantrum because dad likes Thor better. <laughs> And the other part, too, is I think that sometimes nuance is difficult, right? So yeah. uh, we oftentimes don't like a character. Well, uh, let's put it this way. Does a protagonist of a series, uh, are, do they have to do the right thing all the time? Yeah. And it's like, not really. And when you, it, it reminds me in a way of when Cruella came out, another movie, another media piece that I absolutely loved. But yeah. um, you look at that and I saw a lot of people saying, oh, we're making Cruella relatable. And it's like, well, yeah, relatable, but she's not a good guy. And I think in yeah. Loki, it's he's never really a good guy, ultimately, although he does good guy things sometimes. He's more this chaotic, neutral, which is, yeah. as my son... <laughs> As my son, who's in more into D and D, has has assured me, chaotic neutral is the most annoying character to deal with, and also then also hard to go. Oh yeah, this is a crime versus crime story in the case of Gorilla, or it's like yeah. this is a you know bad versus worse antagonist protagonist, or this is so you know Loki. It, we're seeing like, do we care that you know I've seen people? Oh, I don't care if, if he falls in love. What does he have the right to fall in love? It's like well, everybody has you know yeah. has an inherent ability to love or be loved and so what do we do and so ultimately it's just you know he's that character a lot of what he does in loki is selfishly motivated 
right? Oh, yeah, Even and, and it, is, right it is neutral in the sense that it's all about him. It's what works for him in this circumstance for the long run. And I, and again, that was the other part that I liked about the dynamic that he had with Mobius because Mobius was kind of calling him on stuff. It was the whole, okay, so, you know, what were you doing in New York? Well, I'm trying to take it over. It's basically, I want to, you know, I want to rule Midgard. Then I want to go after, you know, the other nine realms. Like, okay, so you just want to be like the leader of everything. And then what? And it was just like, well, I'm just going to be the leader of everything. And so, yeah, let's and it was that weird kind of like, I just want to be in charge. I just want to be the boss. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, and again, this is going to sort of go off on another tangent, but I think about the kind of the, the stuff that happens in Dune and you, when you go through that thread with, you know, Leto with Paul and then with Leto the second and, and, you know, other characters there, you see they have this, and again, it may be delusional, but they have at least a sense of what they're going to do with their leadership and they think it's good. Yeah. Um, so they may be, you know, they may perceive themselves as chaotic good now <laughs> or even lawful good, yeah. but w- the implications that they have, whereas Loki, you know, and, and, they're, and they're trying to project out over long periods of time, whereas Loki is just, well, I want to do the thing and I want to be in charge because I'm tired of not being in charge. I was supposed to be, you know, in charge yeah. here or I was supposed to be in charge there or I could do this better than so-and-so. And But the part that's funny is that in a sense, he has no vision. And he just right. wants to. And there's an element which, in fact, just like uh, with many other characters, right, the greatest villains don't look at themselves as villains. And what yeah. I believe it's even in the first Avengers where he talks about the burden of freedom on people. Was, Won't you be oh. happy to be relieved of that freedom because yeah. I'll be in charge? But you see, but that's the part that I found interesting was that running thread mm-hmm. because his whole issue within being within the TVA is that he doesn't have freedom and you can't hold me back. So it's this yeah. weird thing where it's like, I'm going to organize your world and I'm going to be in charge and everything's fine. Yeah. And then it's like, well, you realize that that totally counters what you're actually going through right now and how it's like the, I make my own path and I do this yeah. and I do that. And you can't tell me that this was, you know, predetermined or well and again even that that again the opening part there where it's the whole hey wait a minute what about the like what about the avengers you know you give me a task force and a team and i'll go get them and yeah you because know, they've been totally messing with the timeline it's like oh no 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 that was that we, we expected that and it's like oh wait a minute yeah no, <laughs> like, and, and i, I that, take the right. tesseract and jump into the gobi desert and i'm all suddenly in shit but you're like <laughs> they were doing what and it's okay so yes. again it, it's that whole like he just one more example of being indignant but like you say the freedom thing like he has this real problem with the notion that his life or anything, you know, this whole timeline predetermined, et cetera. But his whole goal is, well, I'm just going to be the boss of everybody because it'll make your lives easier. There's that, you see that elitism, which I guess we should say with, uh, uh, you know, wealthy prince, you know, probably not surprising, but there's the elitism of saying, I can make decisions. I should be free. You mm-hmm. know, the rest of you were just born normal and that's your crime. So I'll take over from here. And I think we see that reflected. And once again, we we're okay with it when it's Downton Abbey, um, where we kind of are on their side that they're in charge. Not not totally, but we are a little. Yeah. And so anyway, it just it's an interesting thing to see. One of the parts we we've already touched on that might be good to to focus on is I thought it was amazing how the whole first episode and it's sprinkled throughout, but the whole first episode um, was essentially a therapy session. With Mobius and Loki, right? It's like an aggressive therapy session to be like, yeah. okay, here's how you are. What do you really want? What is it you're really uh, trying to yeah. flash into a bad Owen Wilson impression here? But yeah, um, and I thought that was fascinating that we're right away attacking, um, and at, at the same time touching on a lot of like the comic lore as well as the movie lore, mm-hmm. and saying like, here's how you play out. In all these ways, but essentially getting to the roots of his own psychology, right? Oh, absolutely. I, and, and I think that's one of the things that I've liked about some of these, you know, and again, we talked about it with like um, Falcon and Winter Soldier and with WandaVision is, is that they've had these opportunities to go deep. And so you're not missing out on action or anything, but it's allowing again, that, that reflection and, and these little, again, in different ways. I mean, in some cases it was actual therapy <laughs> you know, with, <laughs> with, uh, with Bucky, but yeah, like these little things where they get to do these and they're not just the, here's a series of flashback things done in some kind of, you know, way that doesn't forward the story. And, and, and like I said, I, I think it was really interesting in terms of, uh, you know, again, Mobius's character development as well, because they were these foils for each other 
And, and it was the kind of dynamic that, you know, nobody else could call Loki on these other things that he's in, engaged with before, because it's not like, you know, not like he and Thor are going to have that kind of conversation. Right. Um, they, <laughs> you know, that's just, you know, they're not going to sit down over beers and sort their stuff out. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's always going to be, you know, some sort of friction there. And even when they have tried to do stuff again, there's always, again, that friction uh, or something else or snide comments, whatever. Um, or the, you know, uh, what's the, um, get help, you know, that, <laughs> there's, there's their big right. moment of bonding, get help. I don't like get help. Uh, you know? Well, and you uh, see, yeah, you see those elements too, of that existence of a relationship. Cause we see in the show, he does a reflection on where it is really, it, it was done for different reasons for laughs partially, but where Loki was actually DB Cooper, um, which people, yeah. whether they realize or not. And some, I noticed with my, my, uh, my son had heard about, had read about DB Cooper. My daughter hadn't, and it was like, yeah, it was a real thing. But in this case, he says basically he was pressured into it because he lost a bet with Thor. So there's yeah. some indication that it's like, oh, we've had these good times too. And what, you know, I don't know what bet leads to <laughs> having to hijack a plane, but um, and and a very safe crime for them to pick for him because. Apparently, you know, because in the reality, nobody got hurt, and it was like this little charming wink to the, you know, kind yeah, of to everybody. It was, a, it was a nod to the real world kind of thing. So no, it was yeah. it was, but I, 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 and that's the thing that I liked that they would have, like, you know, again to me that was again one of we'd say the, an Easter egg of sorts in the sense that it's a nod to the real world, mm -hmm. and I think they did do the psychology and even just the different things, like for example, like when they go back to Pompeii and how he sits there, and again. You know, the, the, the little monologue that he has is, is it's all going sideways as they test the theory about the other variant. And I guess that was the other part, too, that I liked was the way Owen, you know, the way they use Owen Wilson's character, you know, to kind of come in and go, well, like, this is I'm in a sense I'm studying him. I, I need to know how a Loki thinks to catch what I believe is another Loki variant and then that even goes into the whole idea which I again I really loved how they pursued because it gave you the opportunity to again have all the nods back to what happened in the all the variations that there have been in the comics and 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 those kinds of things so you you and again drop the multiverse thing okay this is what happens when you go off and these different things but it was the idea of um, him having to reflect on oh wait a second you know other versions of me which again, while it was done as variants are really just aspects of different aspects of personality. And so for me, what a lot of this was, was it was the, the, the you know, the literally the many sides of Loki and, and the, the idea that we all actually have different versions of ourselves in the sense that, and again, it's not like, you know, this is not talking about a, you know, a, a dissociative identity disorder. And, you know, it's more about the, well, you know, there's, there's your work, you know, how you act at work versus what you, you know, do at, you know, with your, maybe your community soccer group versus, you know, like the, there's just different, you, we tend to compartmentalize ourselves. And I mean, part of that's just functioning. You that's know, the it, thing it, is there's a healthy aspect to that, that mm -hmm. if we couldn't do it at all, we couldn't hold a job. Right. Yeah. If we couldn't do it all, we probably couldn't have friendships and relationships or we couldn't go to a funeral because we would act just the same as if we were with our friends or or we'd be so repressed. Other If we were just, you know, one way all the time, we all edit, you know, who, what we express at various times. And that's mm -hmm. healthy. Right. There's a healthiness. And then there's a sickness or illness to it as well, which was very interesting when we see the classic Loki in the ridiculous old co old comic book outfit with the horns and everything. Um, after they run into, once again, the different aspects, right? Because they're in their hiding yeah. place and in come the other Lokis and other whatever. And they're like, we're going to take over. And they're like, take over what? We don't have <laughs> anything, you know? And it's like, no, we're still going to take over. And, and uh, which goes to Mobius's point. You don't even care what you're ruling. You just want to rule. Exactly. And then yeah. they get out of that situation and there's, I think, just very interesting dialogue that you hear where classic Loki says, we're sick. There's a sickness in Lokis, right? Mm -hmm. And then kid Loki says, and whenever we try to change, we get pruned, right? Whenever we yeah. try to change, that means we're breaking the timeline and the TVA shows up and gets us. 
Um, yeah. And so it's like, we can be sick, but we can't be healthy. And there's a real mm-hmm. feeling of I'm not allowed to be healthy, not allowed to change. Exactly. And that's what I thought was really interesting because it is this idea that, okay, so hold on. In a sense, the reason why, I mean, again, we've enjoyed them and all of these things, but you you suddenly get into this place, especially when um, Mobius starts asking those questions. And then this stuff comes up later where you go, oh my gosh, in some respects, yeah, he's been limited to who he can be. And he's in a sense bought into it because, well, he's the God of mischief. He's this and that. And so there's literally just again, we love him, but you suddenly go, wait a second, is he even more one dimensional than we realized and more than he's realized that he's been playing this role, thinking it's this rich, wonderful, I'm in charge of everything kind of thing. And how often do we get caught into that where some aspect of our lives um, keeps us pinned into something? So is it, again, is it based on a you know family dynamic? So I'm the blah, 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 blah in the family, yeah. you know, either I, you know, am I the, um, you know, I, I was the kid that, you know, did well in school. So therefore I'm forever the nerd that has to do well. And God forbid I fail. Or am I the kid that because I did well in sports, I've been painted, you know, as the dumb jock. And therefore, you know, the fact that I want to go and do a master's degree, you know, everybody in the family gives me side eye and, you know, ha, ha, ha. But that, that thing where you're, you know, expected to play a role and God forbid you try to leave it or again, toxic family environment and you, you know you try to leave the toxic sandbox and, yeah. you know everybody just starts flinging sand and the and cat food is, you know in the public sandbox like it's, yeah. it's that kind of thing where you realize it's like oh wait a second that that nexus and that the pruning of the timeline can be like any of those sorts of things and yeah what does that say about any of us or what you know like to me that was one of those it's yes it's it's loki's and loki variants But that's kind of a universal truth or something that most of us experience at some point where, wait a second, one version of me is the version that, you know, I'm expected to be 24-7 and I'm not allowed to be anything else. So, yeah, when he sits there and goes, I'm supposed to be the ruler of everything and be this and be that. And you're like, okay, well, how much of that is just because that's, again, maybe one aspect of him, but then that's all he was allowed to be. And then there were just these, you know again, different timelines, different, whatever, where they, I'm Loki, I'm the that. God of mischief. And if I'm doing it in, in weird, bad tights, you know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or as you know, an alligator, so still, whatever. Yeah. I don't know if the alligator ever overthrew anyone, but, um, and once again, you've got that every man element where Owen Wilson's like, why are, why is one of you an alligator? That doesn't make any sense. Um, but, which is fun, of course. But yeah. but it's interesting how we see, and you can see this, I'm going to bring in a little bit of Ragnarok here and say, let's take the elevator ride with Thor. You know, and Thor is at this point kind of saying, hey, we're reaching out. We could be a thing that, you know, mm-hmm. as brothers. And he says, eh, but then he says, but you should stay here. You know, you really should stay here because you're going to lie and murder your way to the top and you you could do well here. And it's like, so there's <laughs> Thor, there's Thor pushing the role that Loki plays. And yeah. then we see Loki tries to betray him again, uh, right, right then, which is then Loki reinforcing his own s- status in that role. And you see that just like you're talking about where on the one hand, maybe we're trapped by expectations but then we maybe feed into that and say, well, I'm trapped by expectations. I might as well play the role. Yeah. It's, right? it's, if you're going to paint me into this corner, I might as well, you know, at least pick the color of paint. <laughs> yes. That's a great way to say it. It, it reminds me of uh, Salvador Mnuchin, who's one of the pioneers of family therapy. And he's written all these, these different books. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite phrases, he, he talks about using techniques to help other people. And he said, techniques only work if you learn them well enough that you forget you know them and they just become part of you. So that's one of my favorite concepts in, in, in being a helper person. But he uh, would one of the things he would do is he liked to do therapy with the whole family and say, oh, someone brings in their kid and say, my kid misbehaves. And he said, okay, so you need therapy to handle a kid who misbehaves. No, 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 that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant, you know. So he would take that approach of saying, what's broken in your family system? And Mm -hmm. almost always there's a scapegoat person who's like, well, what's broken is dad, mom, kid, whoever. And he would attack that. And it was interesting because he usually would do one of two things. He would either say, no, you're not. It's like, oh, well, you know, the problem here is that this person is fill in the blank. And he'd say, no, they're not. What? 
Yeah, they are. They did this last week. Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't mean that. And and he would challenge it up front. The other thing he would do that was interesting is sometimes, depending on the family, he would go the other route and say, oh, wow. Like he tells a story of a family that was multi-generational and they had uh, they came in and their mom or grandma was oh so sickly and she can't do anything and what we're you know but we're frustrated and resentful and she's you know all these things and so he really started pouring into this concept of saying I know you just can't you know you're probably doing too much you know yeah just like they said you can't you can't you're not able to do anything and uh, boy you want to take a trip uh, you shouldn't do that no you should just probably and you did you go to the store the other day you said it was you were talking you probably shouldn't do that you should send them to the store you probably enough that he provoked a resentment in her to say well I'm not that bad and then he'd flip it and say you know you're right you're not that bad in fact mm-hmm. you're how bad are you really you know there's part of you that knows you can do more and that you can be empowered Right. And so it's interesting to see how attacking these roles is key to health. Right. And saying, let me try Mm -hmm. to redefine myself and who I am and to do so. And this maybe I'm reaching. I don't know if they meant it this way, but to surround Loki with these kind of like fan service Easter eggs. Fun. Oh, I just whacked into my my microphone there. So apologies to anyone if I, especially because I'll totally forget to edit it out. But um, that's my role. I'm I'm trapped in, so I'm not going to try to fix that. So, you know, but but to say also surrounded by all of these little hallmarks of pieces of the universe and alternate realities to say, um, wow, there's a lot that can be different, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot that can be changed. Um, if Thanos can rob a bank with a helicopter in one reality and destroy reality in another reality, well, gee, maybe I should be different. Maybe I could challenge, you know, what am I willing to do selfishness or selflessness wise? Um, Yeah. Well, and and that's what I love too about his relationship with Sylvie. And there was a whole other thing there where, I mean, and again, people toyed with, okay, the nods, the enchantress and all these other different things. But I mean, what I really loved was that, yeah, obviously they gave her a, a different name, uh, in the sense that, you know, you're going to have Loki, Lady, Loki, whatever kind of thing that they, you know, so it's the idea that she is differentiated on one level. And then at the same time, it's like, oh, that the proverbial, like, you know, you'd see these two and they're literally arguing into a mirror, <laughs> you know? Yes, exactly. And, and, and that was just this brilliant thing where it's like, you're so this, and it's like, well, you know, and, and you, you're you're not recognizing again. You're seeing it as the viewer, but they're not seeing it. It's like you're accusing somebody of something that you are doing exactly the same, yeah. but apparently you don't think you are. And it was that. So that's what I loved was the fact that they were a mirror to each other, and that I loved again the other ones being brought in so that it 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 fleshed it out more. But the idea of the two of them as this running thread, because and the fact that it you know, and, and again, people got into the whole. Uh, again, all the issues around gender there, because you see that it's noted that, you know, on his on his paperwork in one of those those shots, it's like, you know, fluid is put there. So it's the idea that that's right. going to be fluid. And again, maybe slightly more, you know, fixed in one area in, in one reality than another potentially. But the idea that that's there. And, and so in, uh, what grows between them as a relationship, I yeah. thought was the, again, the, you know, you talk about, you know, is he entitled to a relationship in love? And it's also a bit of the again, because this is another manifestation of himself, another, it's the idea of self-love that one of the things that you, you kind of come to realize is that not only is he bought into a role as again, gets kind of explained to us the way through, but it's the idea that there's a certain element of self-loathing or if not self-loathing, at least self-doubt and a lack of confidence that gets then, you know, that's almost the source of the bombast of, you know, being burdened with glorious purpose and the, you know, God of mischief and all this kind of, you know, the, the pomposity is, you know, that overinflation, that puffing up so that nobody sees this other stuff. And then in some respects, you've got Mobius and Sylvie who are in a way, and some of the other, you know, some of the other characters in a lesser way, calling him on his, crap and calling him on his so i mean i love that and so you know and again people got into the weird like okay is this creepy because he's a variant of himself or yeah all these other things i'm like just like you know what like (laughs) well and and as a matter of fact this is about self-love in a way it's actually really interesting and i hadn't i hadn't really clued in like when you talk about it um with the self-love aspect one of the things that i hadn't put these two together in my head right 
um, but they say that narcissism at its root is self-loathing, right? And that mm-hmm. it's it's a it's a house of cards we build around the self-loathing. And the house of cards looks fantastic, isn't that cool? I can make a house of cards, but don't touch yeah. it, don't knock it down. I'll kill yeah. you. I'll kill you if you try to, you know. And it's like, whoa, that got that got ugly really quick. And those narcissistic actions are so ugly and so toxic that we forget that deep down there's this self-loathing and you've got mm-hmm. Mobius at first saying like, you're in love with yourself. Well, that just makes sense. Doesn't it? You know, because <laughs> you're the ultimate narcissist. And then there's, and then we have examples of like the moment with the, the blanket of like, boy, I can make a blanket and I, and we don't really need one anyway. And it's like, I don't yeah. know how to relate to myself and, and to love this other person, which in the way, so that's like, you have both the examples of a sick self-love narcissism Mm -hmm. versus the healing self-love which is actual acceptance love being able to be there and and i would say ultimately in the end one of the problems is that there's the lack of trust how does he put Mm -hmm. it you can't trust me because i'm not trustworthy and i can't trust you right because i don't trust because my trust is broken sort of like like my internal trust ability isn't there i'm sure it was that was just the most concise way i could have said that probably exact quote no i was a little bit more snappy in the thing and so there's that limit of trust you can't you can love without trust but you can't express the love the same way without trust right because it's not safe and i think that's ultimately where they they have uh, separation and distinctness in their behaviors is the damage to the self-love because they both go into their agendas, which yeah. is the unhealthy self-love, right? And she's like, no, I got to kill this guy. And he's like, no, we got to take over. And it's like yeah. both of those in a way could be seen as the unhealthy selfish love of like, I got to yeah. do what I yeah, got to exactly. do. I've got the yeah. answer. You're wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I never I hadn't uh I hadn't tied that together till you were saying that with the, oh, cool. the self-love aspect. So that's that's interesting. To see. Well, and that, and that for me how I looked at it was it took him having to see again these these variants, these external manifestations of himself. Yeah. And and again, maybe not necessarily acknowledging because I mean that you know that it was a reflection and they were because that was again one of their things is the well, you can't be me and I can't be you kind of thing. And this is, you know, you're at, at best you're a pale knockoff of me kind of thing, or you're a co- whatever that again, however they would which of us is a copy off the other, right? There's yeah, that kind exactly. of face off they have on the train where it's yeah. like, meh, you're me. No, nah, you're me. Yeah, that's the yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and and that that I'm the original version and that as as being a copy in the same way that, you know, you run something through the photocopier, it's not, as, you know, it doesn't matter how good the copier is, right? It's not the same. <laughs> and so that's, uh, that was that whole thing. And I think it was really interesting because while that was an ongoing thread, it, it went right through to the, like to those trust issues that as much as they started to both see, feel and, and respond a certain way and gained at least some level or beginning to, you know, address notions of self-love and self-acceptance, there was always those things that would, you know, one of them would literally trigger the other and bring it back to, no, no trust, no, whatever, going to go back, get back into my little house of cards where I'm the king of the world and, or where I should be the king of the world and I'm going to do my thing. So, no, I think it was, like I said, I, I loved it as a series and I thought they tackled so many things that I found sometimes when I was, again, like you're talking about, like what you find on the internet, I'm like, okay, you know what, other people are getting caught up in this other stuff and I feel like they're missing a layer and now maybe that's just overthinking me. And the fact that I, you see, because the other part that in terms of like my program, I use Loki to talk about multiple, when we live with multiple diagnoses and the idea that these are all each a part of us, but you know, are we, again, are we in a healthy place? Are things feeding off and flaring each, you know, is, okay, is my anxiety triggering something depressive is the, you know, is my ADHD and it's the, you know, again, you're all the same person in some respect. And so that's how I looked at it was the, and and what happens when you get them all in a room? Yeah. 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 Oh, crocodile bites off some, or alligator bites off somebody's hand, you know, like it was just, you know, but so that's how I look at that is that Loki represented that for me was the idea that, you know, you can have these variations they're all you but they're all you in a different context and that even goes to again even from a non-diagnosis perspective that idea of the roles again that each of them was playing a role in whatever their reality was and And similar but different so it's it's that way of um yeah to me there's just layers and layers and layers (laughs) 
Oh, no, no. And it's fascinating, too, to look at the different forms of evolution. You've got, I think, the kid Loki character expresses this idea of regret. He's like, he killed Thor, right? He accomplished his goal of killing Thor and didn't seem to like it very much. Uh, yeah. And then you have the the great act of self-sacrifice, The I mean, literal self-sacrifice by old classic Loki. Yeah. And one of the things that... Um, that 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 came from would be his years and years and years of self isolation, right? Of being like I needed to, and and it's fascinating again to say his fix, his cure for his own narcissistic and destructive tendencies was I can't be around people because I'm not yeah. safe, right? He's like I have to be here, and then it was when he dared to want to re-engage that of course that he wasn't allowed to get better that way but mm. but to be ultimately he had rejected weaponry in a way which not that he didn't you know mess around with people or or hurt people at all but at that point it was like no no you don't need to be carrying knives and stuff and you yeah. know, and also accessing this idea that you are more powerful then you know I'm going to manifest a whole... And in a way, you know, here's a symbolism of like, he's going to create his home. He's going to create Asgard and, you know, and say, I have access to it and I'm giving up my own self to say... And that's where he he really ties into an actual glorious purpose, which is mm -hmm. I'm going to die for this part of myself to live on and for the greater good of the universe and the timeline, hopefully, we don't really know, you know, yeah. whatever. That gets into that. But to say, for a bigger reason than myself, and that came from years and years of self-introspection, right? Yeah, and, yeah, that he, he literally he sat there at the end of the universe, you know, yeah, like, yeah. this is where I'm safe. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there's a couple of different forms of therapy that when you get into it, uh, let's say neuro-linguistic programming, is, is one, and also what they call internal family systems, which is when you yeah. set up and have your own emotional parts talk to each other or you confront. Gestalt does a little of this. And, and yeah. es essentially what I'm trying to say is there's a approach that says that, um, in a sense, artificial, you could call it, or you could call it imagined. I mean, I think it's uh, the proponents of those theories would say it's a, much deeper than that. But to say I'm going to sit here with an emotional part of me or I'm going to do an empty chair discussion with a, a loved one who isn't really accessible to me emotionally or maybe, you know, they're dead mm -hmm. or something. And it, it, so you could say it's a simulated uh, change. And I guess I'm, I'm bringing that in to say if I'm Loki and if I'm in his shoes of the prime Loki in this series, uh, I can watch that Loki – and his growth and his experience. And do I take that part and say, oh, I, I learned that. I learned from that. And yeah. you know, I have benefited from this alternate timeline, it, literally in that case. But, mm -hmm. but in therapy, sometimes we're trying to do an alternate timeline of what did my young, abused, younger, less experienced, abused self need? And can I yeah. picture myself going back in time and giving mm -hmm. that confidence and acceptance and support? And do I benefit internally in some ways, as if I actually had that. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. You know, we, I mean? we, we, you know, we talk about how you need to reparent your inner child kind of thing and give them, you know, what's the things that you would give them? You know, what were you missing and what were you, you know, huh? yeah, and having those conversations and that. So, no, I, and I think that was the one thing that this did was in so many ways it played out. Uh, you know, and again, I don't think anybody was sitting there with, you know, the, you know, I'm not expecting the writers to be sitting down with a, a selection of different, okay, well, hold on, let me pick up the Gestalt textbook and, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, right. And I had that, but, but, and, and, and uh, oh, there was this wonderful thing that my family and I did in therapy. Hold on, we need that in episode three. I don't think yeah. they were doing that, you know, explicitly, but it's interesting because they played out those, exactly those kinds of parallels that were in there. And you're like, okay, that's a snippet. Or like you say, he got to play out those conversations, those things. It's just that rather than talking to an empty, empty chair, maybe he's talking to Sylvie or maybe he's yeah. talking like it was, it, you, you saw it played out differently. Um, and that in a sense it got, I don't want to say lost, but the, there was like a camouflage over it in the sense that it was played out with certain kinds of characters where you're like, Oh, wait a second, hold on. You peel that layer back and that's really so-and-so is in the role of this and that. And that's even where I think it was interesting watching them, challenge themselves on their role so it was interesting to see sort of like uh, the the initial therapy session you know with mobius there in that first episode the sort of the what i'd call like the the, the parallel peer support kind of therapy stuff that we saw with 
<laughs> with Sylvie and Loki. And then it's like, oh, and look at it. And now we have the family session <laughs> towards the end right. as the other Lokis come in. <laughs> okay. Everybody's going to sit down and they're all going to talk about, you know. <laughs> and, and which, again, when you think about it, they're the same but different. So in the same ways, there's that that element of the shared within the family, right? And they talk about their roles and, and that old idea. Well, you say that I'm the, again the blah, 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 blah within the family. And, but instead they're, they're self-identifying. Well, I'm the such and such. And then I, well, no, 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 actually you're this and that. So it was, again, different characters within the same family, but at the same time, different characters from different, yes. um, you know, variations. So like I said, it, it was, it was really interesting. Like I, I, there, there's, there's part of me that wonders, you know, how many of the writing staff have like, you know, got their undergrads in psych or something like that. Or have been through <laughs> maybe their, their own. Right, have been through yeah. their own kind of therapy experiences too, right? Yeah, and uh, and of course uh, Richard Grant, I think is his name, right? Let's see, yeah, who played classic Loki. And if you if you're like me and have a, at all a guilty pleasure of the movie Hudson Hawk, if anyone hasn't seen that, go back and see how crazy he can act. So, with Nail and I, with Nail and I is awesome. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, that he he really. That's how old I am. <laughs> so, um. So I, I wanted to I wanted to hit and I don't know if we'll get anything meaningful from this other than it was cool, but uh, particularly in the limbo end of the universe land after they get pruned, mm-hmm. uh, all the things that are there, right? So because you've got, for example, New York Avengers Tower, I didn't realize till I was like doing some rewatching or, or doing some uh, actually reading up on the Easter eggs that uh, Stark Tower is there destroyed, but it says Kang on Stark Tower, which goes back to some of the comics where Kang Industries purchased Stark Tower and was a rival. And it turned out, of course, it was run by Kang the Conqueror, who is coming up uh, at some point or might even be the guy who was the guy in this one. But um, but we also saw... Yeah, like, I remember like the Thanos helicopter and stuff. Like, yes, that was the yes. other thing, and I haven't had the chance to do it, is to literally do the whole, okay, I'm going to stop on this frame, I'm going to stop on that frame. Right, right. Because we found ourselves starting to do it a little bit with the the closing credits and seeing different, like the posters mm-hmm. and the paperwork. And yes, yes. yes. So that's, and that's still on the to-do list. <laughs> you had, And you had mentioned uh, something I think is really important to the character development, which is, we learned that with both sexual orientation and identity, right, mm-hmm. which are very different, um, that, that there's a fluidity there. That Loki, because yeah. he's a shapeshifter, he's been Lady Loki, he can, that his, and then when they're talking on the train and she's like, you got a prince or a princess or whoever that you, and he's like, eh, some of both, you know, and yeah. there's a bisexuality as well, um, which there's an inclusivity there, but also, uh, you know, just kind of showing, I don't know, showing more of who the character is as a person. Yeah. Well, and I think that's something too, that often gets forgotten about, like as much as Marvel has, um, you know, changed things from the, you know, the traditional Norse mythology in terms of, you know, the, the idea of, of Thor and Loki as siblings rather than Loki as a blood brother to Odin. Like, I mean, there's been little things like that, but there's so much of it that is really true to the character and and that was in there and and so you know i think it's interesting because again that's something that's millennia old yeah. and and of all the things now again you know how much has it been brought to the surface at different times and places based on again larger social you know circumstances and so i just i think it's brilliant as well because it it is one of those things where there's you know the comic book world has really, you know, like, so like, again, as a reflection of larger society, even if it's sometimes seen as a, you know, this thing off to the side and quirky has still reflected a lot of gender roles and, and gender stereotypes. So, I mean, Loki is this, again, how they put that on there, how they did the variants Um, again, Sylvie's role, all those kinds of things. It was a really nice way of doing it in the sense that it's, it's true to the character, both, Mm -hmm in Norse mythology and whatever. And it's not necessarily an aspect that is put out there a lot, nor does it have to be like front and center in some weird, like aggressive way, but it was just the, yeah, it's a thing. Yeah. And he moves on. (laughs) So we also saw, let's see. um, And I, I had to go back and read and watch some YouTube videos to get some of these, but yellow jackets helmet and a huge, huge version of yellow jackets helmet was on the ground. Um, oh, as if it was, you know, uh, enhanced or grown. Red Skull's plane. There was a helicarrier there. 
Um, I remember the helicarrier, yeah. There was a statue of a character that was called like the Living Tribunal. I didn't know that character, but that was one that was there. Um, and of course, you mentioned the Thanos copter. And I'd written yep. down it was from the old Spidey uh, Spidey Stories number thirty nine. Is what they plugged it. Oh yeah, like it's 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 it's, it's really kinda, it's an old one. Like I remember yeah. seeing the pictures of it, and you're just like, wow, that's like the old school like style. Of <laughs> right. Yeah, that Thanos would have a helicopter around, and he was. I I, I believe uh, the story I read up on. It's kind of become infamous of like a silly thing. In fact, it even appeared in a Deadpool comic making fun of, you know, Yeah, because we're like, Thanos is this powerful yeah. titan and he requires a yellow <laughs> helicopter? And it says Thanos <laughs> on the side. Yeah. Um, and there's a there's a panel that's become a famous meme where it just shows him landing and going like, hey, Deadpool, it's me, Thanos. <laughs> you know? Um, so not Josh Brolin's version. Yeah. At least not yet. Uh, and, of course, one of the favorites is Frog Thor, right? Uh-huh. Um, as the camera pans down underground when they're going into their bunker, there is a jar containing a frog with Thor clothes that is hopping and trying to get a hold of a Mjolnir that's also buried <laughs> next to it. Yeah. And that's also a comic reference uh, that that Thor turned into a frog at some point. And they liked it. It was so co- uh, popular. They created a character named Throg, who is someone else that became a frog and a splinter of Mjolnir became its own little hammer. So he's got his own little hammer. <laughs> so yeah. just well, kind of silly and fun little things. Once again, going to those well, alternate timelines. But, but I think that's, that, that's the other part that I like about what the Marvel universe has been doing is that when you stop and think about like, again, <laughs> even at the, I call it like the most basic level of like set decoration and whatnot yeah. is, is, and, and costuming and these things. It's like, if you've got these opportunities, you know, like, why not? Like if you've got to have stuff on the back wall or something here or whatever, like it's, it's that opportunity when you know that because of the richness of the canon and the catalog that you can't do everything then you throw in these Easter eggs because it is a way of, okay, at least, you know, a nod. Yeah. And then you never know if it becomes that thing that somebody riffs off later on. So I think right. that's the other part that I love about a lot of the Easter eggs is that you don't know how much of that was, hey, this is a, you know, this is a fun thing. Let's put it out there and see if anybody notices. But it is maybe intended to do something else later or it's not. And somebody else is organically going to. Yeah. You remember that yeah. scene where, OK, I'd love to do blah, blah, you know, and then they pitch an idea. And the next thing, you know, and, and I guess that's that's what I love is the fact that it's there. If you're not somebody that's familiar with all of those things, or even if you are, you may or may not see it. It may or may not have meaning. You're not going to you know, miss something in the larger story because these are not um Again, they're Easter eggs. They're not key plot points necessarily. So mm-hmm. it's it, it just it adds to the the richness to me. And that in some cases, it doesn't matter how far down the rabbit hole you are. There's <laughs> almost always guaranteed to be someone that's further down the rabbit hole. Well, yeah, as I and you're the, say, like you know, I, yeah. I saw these five Easter eggs, but I didn't even realize that was an Easter egg, or I didn't see it, and somebody else had to point it out to me. And that's what I love is that there's just it's it's this it's like a you know, ongoing Where's Waldo kind of thing. <laughs> well, and it goes towards sort of like uh, you become, uh, there's an extension of the relationship a storyteller has with the listener because we can all go, frog, well, there's a frog. Where did that come from? You know, and I re- and that was when I had to rewind because it just whizzes by it. And I was like, that was something moving there. What was that? And so yeah. uh, don't, you know, dash my hopes for a Frog Thor uh, movie or series. Come on, let's <laughs> hope. Let's hope. Yeah. Oh well, no. I mean, and I got to the point too that we. I was like, every time they had like, you know, whether they're they're walking a new variant by, you're just doing the whole like, you know, even that even that first guy where you're like, okay, oh no, he was just there to show like Loki the importance of why you need your ticket and the consequences. But you start to do that thing where you're looking at like everyone or everything as far as the okay again, is this an Easter egg or not? Um, you know, you have. Uh, <laughs> do, do they really just have a random person walking yeah. down the hallway? How, how many people are truly random, and how much is it? Oh, wait a second, that's so and so from blah blah blah. blah. <laughs> every yeah, there's there's planets like every planet in there is represented in Marvel Comics. The limit where they they got destroyed. Oshkosh, Wisconsin is a place where one of the things happens. Both that and the planet that gets destroyed by crashing into its own moon are both. Both tie in with uh, a character named Quasar that that yeah. people might recognize or might maybe maybe he'll show up. Um, you know, there's just like, all these nothing that's random. Like as yeah. much as they've created or different, like created different things, and maybe again 
tweaked into storylines differently. Well, again, they're in the TVA. There's this right. whole multiverse idea, but it's the idea that it's like, you know, if, if you, you needed a story, oh, wait a second, there's this over here. We can, like, again, they can, yeah. you but, know, not just, uh, they're not limited um, in the sense that, you know, okay, you can't do anything. You can't create anything new, but at the same time, it's like, oh my God, you got this richness to pull from. <laughs> Why don't I just bring in this cool thing that I love from, you know, my childhood and reading comics. So that's a good, that's a real good segue for, I want to hit here at, at, towards the end, Talk about, you already mentioned how you use Loki in your program, and hmm. we've talked about your program before, but tell, maybe talk a little more about what you're doing now with that and how you utilize that as ways for people to see themselves and to heal. What, yeah, what do well, you Well, I can tell you that, the, the, that? The, the, first of all, the new website and the member. Oh, is it up? Is it I don't up? want to curry, I don't want to jinx myself. <laughs> Finally in the home stretch. I was literally like checking out like, the back end of it today in terms of pages, but so the, the program's designed based on the idea that um, what I, 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 you've heard me say this before. I came to realize that in, in a sense, in some respects, you know, Stanley was sort of like my first therapist in the sense that there, he gave me all of these characters. Hold on. I'm going to drop my blinds here because I'm just about to go blind uh, with the light coming into my, the sun has finally come out in Winnipeg. I saw that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, it was coming and reflecting right off the snow into my eyes. I just remember, <laughs> I remembered luckily to close my blinds that are right behind my computer. That is, yeah. That'll come in. Yeah. It was cloudy enough when we started, but um, yeah. So what happens <laughs> is with the program is that I and fell in love with these things related to different characters. And then when I actually, because again, I was undiagnosed for so long, uh, when I started actually having, you know, um, positive and supportive therapeutic relationships and started to do things, um, you know, integrated those tools. In, and it was actually later on with my son where I found myself um, having to help him while he waited for diagnosis and, again, was having a lot of issues around self-esteem and found myself reframing tools and using movies that we had seen because I was noticing the patterns. And what was interesting was that watching the, the emergence of, you know, the X-Men movies and the MCU was kind of this interesting pulling stuff back together. So I'd done the cartoons in the nineties with the oldest one, but what I was finding was that is this stuff was bringing it back together. But now I was seeing the parallels with the, the toolkit that I had. And so that's where I started reframing these things. So the, the embrace your superpowers program is about using uh, you know, characters from, from Marvel as uh, I guess you say almost like profiles or markers or just even inspiration. So we've talked about Spidey, like Spidey senses are like anxiety in terms of your, your twitchiness, your sensitivity, what they do. I mean, I, I think of in civil war where he's bouncing around and there's all the chattiness and even, you know, watching the early stages of, of, of Bucky and Sam bonding over like, who's this teenager? Will somebody just, you know, coach him? I, I, um, say, I don't know if you've uh, been in a fight, but anxiety. there's not this but much that? talking. Oh, just when he's like, there's not usually this much talking. So in a fight. talking. Exactly. <laughs> but, but that's a classic example of there's the anxious person that doesn't like the silence. And you can't just do the thing. So it's the, so Spider-Man has that, you know, performative aspect that in some respects reflects anxiety. And so it's using these different characters as creating a safe space. So again, Loki's used for multiple diagnoses. Um, Wolverine and Captain Marvel are used for uh, complex PTSD and PTSD. So trauma responses. Uh, I use Thor to talk about body image and um, relationships with food. And again, there's still ties to, uh, to trauma and other things there, but you know, the reflection on that, um, and just, and even neurodivergence. So like Nightcrawler is, you know, has always been one of my favorite characters and as oh, somebody with, you know, variable attention stimulus trait, he's my guy. <laughs> oh, and, and, um, yeah, I hadn't thought about so him in a long time. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's one of those things where using these characters to represent, or to, to be able to discuss how their traits and their characteristics both reflect the challenges that we have with a certain diagnosis, but also literally the superpowers. And I think that's the other part for me. And I, you know, the nerd in me always gets a little weird when people talk about, oh, blah, blah, blah is my superpower. And I'm like, okay, okay you're just talking about that thing that you, you do really well. A superpower always comes with a cost. It's not just a thing that you do well or that you would ever. It's something that pulls you in both directions and that is either going to, again, if you're brought down the path, you know, led by a, a professor 
X, you're going to get your skills harnessed. It doesn't mean there's going to be less of a challenge, but you're going to train, you're going to be in a supportive environment, or are you going to go down the magneto path where again, you lash out and you do harm to yourself and others. So those are the kinds of metaphors that we use. And it's a way of giving people either if there's someone with lived experience of a diagnosis, a positive way of reframing how they see themselves and acquire tools in a way that are, I mean, I have to say in my own lived experience, sometimes I was given a great tool, but I didn't realize it was a great tool right away because how it was handed to me was like homework or that I was being showed upon. And so this is a way of, it's what I did with my kid, made it engaging, made it fun, made it relatable, made it something where someone, I guess how I put it is uh, most of the best lessons I've ever learned in life were not external things forced upon me. They were things drawn out of me. And so it creates that environment where you can have those conversations and the characters are both um, close enough that they're relatable, but you're also not talking about abstract either case study type characters, nor are people, you know, compelled to talk about themselves. So you can talk about, well, okay, well, you know, so anxiety, you've got a client or a colleague or work, per, you know, some from work and you're worried about, you know, their, their anxiety disrupting things. Well, what do you, you know, let's talk about Peter Parker. Well, hold on. Everybody has empathy for Peter Parker. Okay. Well, if you can have empathy for Peter Parker or Miles Morales or, you know, uh, spider Gwen, then why can't you have, you know, think about that when you think about those, that person, put them in, you know, pop that character. So it's good for both what I call the superheroes and the allies. And so, yeah, so the program is now going to be going online. So I had been offering it before doing um, workshops and keynotes and doing them usually in person. And um, that was a little bit harder in the pandemic. So a lot of the pandemic has been about taking it and turning it into online content where people will basically um, everybody goes through the introductory model of the module and you go through eight missions. So everything is about accomplishing a mission. And then that same eight steps is used in all the subsequent uh, modules that go into either diagnostic in either neurodiversity or mental health. And then there's other things that are larger issues, like looking at how do you create mentally healthy environments, or you can do a module on positive psychology or, and again, all run through, um, through a superhero framework. So like positive psychology, that's the opportunity to explore Steve Rogers. Mm-hmm. And, oh, you know, nice, and, nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, first Avenger, but he's always that guy that again, reframes, sees the positive. He knows he's knee deep in stuff. He He's not, you know, and again, that whole thing, it's not toxic positivity, it's positive psychology. And there's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> He knows he's knee deep in something, but he still will find, okay, what's the way that we can get out of this? And what's the, mm-hmm. so it, it's, a, again, taking all of these different tools and um, delivering them in a way there. So yeah, that's, sorry, that was oh, a cool. run on sentence. The, the vast is, you know, <laughs> taken over. Um, well, it's a very powerful, it's a very powerful perspective. And um, I love getting it out there. I, I told you before, I've adopted it a lot in, in my work with people a lot of yeah. times too, of talking about the weakness versus the superpower. And I just think yeah. it's really, what is the website? Uh, you you got to plug um, it. It's www.speakup.co. The old one is still up. We're having to move the new one onto the server and tweak a few things, but it's yeah, speakup.co. And it's dot .co, and not dot .com. Well, not dot .com, no. Yeah. yeah, and that's a whole other, I won't get into the backstory around that, <laughs> but it is. <laughs> It's dot co <laughs> and and it's speak dash up. Again, I wasn't the one that picked the URL when this was being developed, but and speak up's the larger company. And within that, this is the Embrace Your Superpowers program. And then the other one is the the BTS related one where it's uh bulletproof to stigma and it runs again similar tools through the, I guess now it's coming up on nine years of the the music and videos and other creative content uh by Bang Tong Soyodan. And again, so there's dabbling into um, Jungian psychology. There is, again, peer support, their own approach to um, how they engage. There's a, interestingly enough, some of their songs reflect cognitive behavioral therapy. So I actually just did another presentation at an international conference from a colleague with a colleague from Brazil. And we talked about, uh, again, their stuff with so yeah so i do fandom related mental health and i'm also involved with the diversely geek foundation which is based out of florida and we do fandom related um mental health
Thank you for listening to the Cortem Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Cortem Parts shows, visit cortemparts.com.